Well, good morning, everyone. Today I'm joined by Henry Richardson, Professor of Philosophy in our Department of Philosophy and Senior Research Scholar at our Kennedy Institute of Ethics. And Henry, we've been so grateful for your presence, your scholarship, your teaching, your leadership since you joined our community nearly 35 years ago. So I want to thank you for taking the time to be here this morning and to share some of your reflections. Now, your work explores ethics and moral and political philosophy, and you recently co-authored an article on an ethical framework for international vaccine allocation. Could you share more about what you call the fair priority model and why you think this should be considered? Sure, Jack, and it's an honor and a treat to be with you and talk about these things. Uh, so yes, this was an article that came out in Science at the beginning of September, and it deals, as you say, with the international allocation of any eventual COVID vaccine that may be proven safe and effective. There's been quite a lot of stuff done on domestic allocation, but very little has been done on international. Uh, so a group of 19 of us took this on, 19 mostly philosophers, uh, some health economists and some bioethicists. And uh, the, the problem being faced then is how to distribute vaccine to nations, which is in a way a prior step to what happens domestically. And uh, we realized pretty early on that this is just not your usual problem of distributive justice. For one thing, there's only one commodity being distributed, the vaccine. And also, I think we can be optimistic that this commodity will eventually be offered to everyone, eventually. There's enough commitment on the part of the Vaccine Alliance, for instance, to make sure it gets to the poorest countries eventually. And, so, and, every, and also, everybody will either get it or they won't, right? Nobody needs more to be immunized more than twice in a given period. Uh, so it's, it's not your usual distributive justice problem. And one of our co-authors said, pointing this out early on, that, yeah, you know, eventually everybody will get it. And I was meditating on that. I thought, well, no, that's not quite right, because some people will die before the vaccine reaches their country. And that's really important. Right. And, and that says that, that the problem, since everybody eventually will be offered it, what matters is the timing. When does their country get access to vaccine? So that had us thinking in terms of the urgency of things. And we couldn't think of anything more urgent than the prevention of premature death. Uh, other, other things are irreversible, kind of irreversible organ damage. But, but I, I decided on the basis partly of John Broom's writings about death, that the key thing about death is it can't be, or the unique thing about death is it can't be compensated. That is, you can't compensate a person for having died. Right. You try to compensate the family, but you can't, other things you can make up to people if they have organ damage, you can do other things for them. But right. uh, so really premature death has to be avoided. Um, and that's, that, that's most important. Now there is, so we, we published September 3rd, September 9th, WHO published its ethics guidelines for international allocation. And the, there's, a, there's a big consortium of WHO and the Vaccine Alliance and CEPI, which is the uh, pre Pandemic Preparedness International Alliance. They've gotten together for COVID on this vaccine issue. And what WHO proposed was uh, make sure that the vaccine goes to all countries proportional to population up to 20% of the population, which I'm guessing would use maybe the first year and a half's worth of vaccine production. So that's a big chunk of time. And it's, this is certainly a step in the right direction, what WHO has proposed. The, the Gates Foundation did some modeling on this. and determined that, that the w, if you followed that proposal, it would, it would save maybe twice as many lives as if the rich countries hoarded all the vaccine. But we think that you can do considerably better 
by not having proportional to population, at least not in the first instance. Again, it, every country ought to get that and more eventually, but initially you got to do what's urgent and you don't, in the first instance, send as much vaccine to New Zealand or Taiwan as you do to Peru or Brazil, where there are serious outbreaks going on, whereas hardly anything is happening with the disease in New Zealand or Taiwan. So you got to send it where it's needed, where it's urgently needed. And so uh, we're currently in the process of trying to, to persuade the WHO to, to uh, add in this kind of prioritization to their view. Um, add in that, and also we are, we're <clears throat> the other key plank we were arguing was priority for disadvantaged nations, <clears throat> excuse me. So where, where the key disadvantage in relation to death, we decided was there's considerable inequality in life expectancy and length of life, life lived across countries goes from nearly 85 years life expectancy for someone born in Japan, and it's only barely over 53 years of life expectancy for someone born in the Central African Republic. Quite a disparity. The disparity has been coming down, but that's still quite a lot. And so you don't want to penalize people in those poorer countries for having been born into a country in a system where they can't expect to live long. And so we proposed a way to, to use, there's a standard metric that's used to measure the global burden of disease that would correct for that. Mm -hmm. Use a single global standard based on the Japanese life expectancy tables actually that, that would count how many life years are lost when someone dies at a certain age. So that would be another thing that could improve them was to would be to correct a bit for the disadvantages that are, uh, we, this is a delicate matter. We don't say they're necessarily unjust disadvantages, but they also certainly, these inequalities don't establish a fair baseline for what should happen. Got it. Um, now, now your framework takes a globalist perspective. Could you contrast the fair priority model with what you call vaccine nationalism and how this contributes to our understanding of global justice? Yeah, I, we do take a, a kind of globalist perspective. I mean, it is a global issue, you know, distributing the, the vaccines from the producers to, uh, to all the nations. But we do also think that it's what, what ultimately matters is how well individuals do. There is this vaccine nationalist view, which says rightly that the leaders of nations have special responsibilities for their own citizens. But the question is, how far does that take you? So, so it, it seems also that, especially if you're a rich nation like ours, the, the leaders also have some responsibility for all the people of the world, especially the most disadvantaged ones. And that can compete with what they owe to the citizens. Now, so we were writing for a medical or science journal, ended up in science, as I say, and um, so we had very few words as far as we were concerned. Uh, we started out with aiming at 5,000 words, which is short for a philosophy paper. And uh, we figured we couldn't settle any details on this. And besides, we had, we had people among our 19 authors who had very different views about this. Right. Uh, some people willing to, object to this uh, nationalist permission at all and other people willing to ride, ride it farther. But we agreed that however you go, there's going to be a ceiling to how much you can prioritize your own citizens. And that the upper bound of that was in the, case, in the context of this global emergency, the upper bound of that is uh, you mustn't hold on to more than what you need to get your uh, reproduction rate, your transmission rate down to one, so that so that the <clears throat> the <clears throat> so that the infection stops growing. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, and then so the and it looks like the U.S. you know would would be producing more than that. So we ought to then give any surplus around other countries. And if 
if it's AstraZeneca that produces the vaccine out of the UK and India, you know, they should do the same. And they should be pledged to do the same. Got it, got it. Now, you've mentioned a number of colleagues that you worked with in the, de in the development of this framework. Can you talk mm -hmm. about what it's like to work with such a diverse group of philosophers, bioethicists, public health experts? How are you able to work together to develop a framework that you hope mm. will have an impact in influencing decision makers? Yeah, and uh, absolutely. And f first of all, on a personal note, this was a godsend to me that this project came along because I was on sabbatical working on a big, broad, very abstract moral philosophy topic, and then the pandemic hit. And you know, the philosophy like that requires leisure and undisturbed time to think. And surrounded by the pandemic, that wasn't working so well anymore. And so then I got to work on the pandemic and, and that I could concentrate on. <laughs> and, and this group helped that. Uh, so we met as a seminar of the 19 of us once a week for an hour and a half, being led by Zeke Emanuel, who gathered the group. <clears throat> and Zeke, you know, Zeke can be a real talker and push his view as he does on television, but he, he also was great running the seminar, just listening to people and eliciting conversation. He would listen, and then after we got going a bit, he would start generating drafts for discussion. And then we would say, no, we need to change this or that. And, and then eventually other people contributed some drafts. Uh, somebody else contributed the initial drafting of the nationalism section. And I contributed the initial draft of the positive proposal, uh, which then the rewrote considerably and, and much improved and it all just kept improving and remarkably, you know, we, we were, we, we, we were 19 people from 10 countries, six continents and two different generations. That was a great thing. We had lots of younger people considering not just old, you know, <laughs> established um, graying people. And, and that gave us a lot of energy. Um, and we all just came together and, and I think it'd be because of this urgency of the moment, we knew that something had to be said, you know, and, and, and there wasn't much that had been said to date. Sure, sure. Now, how should we look at the fair priority model in the context of your recent book on moral innovation, articulating the moral community, where you describe how we might articulate and institute new moral norms in a global context. What are some of the insights that are important for us at this moment? Uh, well, at this moment, so uh, this is a tough case for my model operating directly. I mean, that in that book, Articulating the Moral Community, I was dealing with a, a old chestnut of a question in moral philosophy, which is, you know, our moral principles objective and perhaps even eternal or are they just socially constructed? And I was arguing that they're both. So that there are objective moral principles, but there are many of them and they can conflict and those give rise to indeterminacies where things aren't settled morally and we, the moral community can work on filling those in or we can do things that fill in those indeterminacies. Uh, but of course, there's no global moral senate or something like that that could sure. could speak for the moral community. There's no such body that can speak for the moral community. So that process has to be bottom up uh, and start with, I, I argue, start with the people who've got special responsibilities, uh, which means they've got to really work out what would be right in their circumstance. And then maybe consensus can build and the moral community can ratify the upshot somehow. But uh, in our case, and sometimes, and I think there may be arguably cases like that have worked like in global bioethics where practitioners working with individual studies, for instance, about there are cases uh, that Marsha Barron, uh, sorry, Marsha Angel uh, of the New England Journal wrote editorials about the use of placebos in the early HIV vaccine trials, which you would have been aware of from your work in South Africa. And uh, 
it was very controversial to to be giving placebos where there had there existed a existed proven treatment for HIV at the time already, but they were looking to find a cheaper antiretroviral treatment that would work in South Africa. And so, and then the compromise got worked out about that that ha has spread globally, but it was worked out by first by people on the ground and then and then sort of spread upwards. Sure. So our, our approach or this, the way this has happened just so suddenly, it's a little bit top down too much already. Um, but I, so I would be happy here, you know, it doesn't matter to me so much whether a new moral norm gets established on the vaccine stuff. What matters is that the world come to some consensus that the COVAX facility, this consortium that's going to have the biggest impact, um, come to some agreement uh, that can, can legitimize the, can be a thoughtful, legitimate way of distributing vaccine around the world. Got it. Um, Got it. That, would, that would certainly be enough. Got it. Now, um, last year, you received a John Simon Guggenheim Fellowship to work on a new book on moral labor. Well, I know that the pandemic, as you shared, has shifted some of your focus to issues like the ones mm -hmm. we've just discussed. Can you talk a little bit about what you're hoping to explore or illuminate in your new project? Sure, and I, and I got some work done. I mean, I had, you know, up until March. Um, yeah, so it's a fo it follows on the Articulating the Moral Community book, which was talking about people with special responsibilities. So special responsibilities like to care for your children or your patients, um, uh, or the special responsibilities of leaders of these international organizations to to distribute vaccine fairly. These are sure. special responsibilities depending on where you sit, as it were, or what your what your position or role is. And these get uh, worked out in practice. Again, it's part of the bottom-up evolution of how these things go. And here are two examples of, and, and so this division of moral labor that I'm talking about, I think of as in the first instance, a division of labor among principles. Uh, so different principles playing a role in different circumstances. Uh, and examples of things I was looking at and, and got the, made the most progress with uh, are first of all, the case of what's just in an unjust circumstance. So what's just to do when the system is unjust or you're, you're you know, you're working within a systemically unjust circumstance. Uh, and there, I think there's a great exemplar uh, in Tommy Shelby's book, Dark Ghettos. Mm -hmm. This is ju just the kind of question he pursues. Now he's interested in the substance and I'm interested in the methodology of what he's doing, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm also interested in the substance. So he's asking questions like, Okay, people say that to cure racial injustice in this country, uh, everybody ought to integrate residentially. And Shelby asks about that, well, that might be necessary as a solution or a key part of the solution, but do black people have an obligation to integrate with the white people? They're, they're the oppressed people here. <clears throat> And you know they they might have reasons, good reasons, why they you're uncomfortable being around white people. It's too much of a burden on their liberty of where they want to live. To sure. they, they've got an obligation to integrate white people. Yes, they do. We're the beneficiaries of of the legacy of of white supremacy, if not the reality of it. Um, have re that's a separate controversial issue. Uh, so this obligation does bind white people, but not the black people. So it's a great example of asking what are the obligations of justice that fall on these people in these unjust circumstances, much more complicatedly than if things were just, if you imagined a just society, Sure. get to this sort of distinction. Sure. And uh, i give you the other example. Um, 
where I made some headway, I think uh, I was invited anyway to talk about human dignity and, and I was thinking about that through this lens. <clears throat> and I don't, I just, I decided partly based on uh, Andrea San Giovanni's book about human dignity that it's difficult for the idea of human dignity to work as the foundation of human rights. Many people have taken it as such, but I, I think it, it tends to presuppose the human moral equality that, uh, that's supposed to be argued for. And instead, I think what we can do though is learn about human dignity in a bottom up way by learning, out, learning about paying attention to specific aspects of human pro aspects of human practice where dignity is specially paid attention to. So one example of that is the workplace dignity. There's quite a developed theory of workplace dignity, which has specific specifications pertaining to what arises in the workplace or adequate consultation of the workers and so on. Um, there's a, there was the dramatic case of the app iPhone manufacturing plant in China, 2010, Foxconn mm -hmm. plant, terrible conditions, overwork, right. workers housed on the place. And there was this horrific spate of suicides in an eight month period. I, I remember. Yeah, and all sorts of horrific aspects of it, but the aspect of it that really grabbed me when I read about the press accounts was uh, these workers were housed 10 to a room and the management had gone to special lengths to make sure that each room didn't have any two people from any one region, any two people from any one part of the plant. Now, if this were, you know, kind of thing Georgetown were to have done, that would say, well, we want people to meet everybody from everywhere. But that's not how this works. These people were overworked. They were worked to the bone. They were dead tired. And they were put in with people they could hardly, hardly talk to and had nothing in common with. So it seemed like it was a, a way to further tamp down the possibility of any pushback from the workers and just a further degradation of their dignity to, to do that. Right. Um, and I could give you one other example. But, sure, sure. Um, of, of, of this sp specialized work in a certain context on dignity uh, is dignity for relatively severe Alzheimer's sufferers. So there's roughly like three stages of Alzheimer's. Uh, in the late stage, people don't have any awareness of themselves as an agent really, but there's a mid stage where what's going on is that people for good reason start to doubt their capacities as an agent. Uh, there's the term gaslighting, which has become prominent in current discourse, unfortunately, I mean, for unfortunate reasons. Uh, but before that, the philosophers had been on to this idea of gaslighting as uh, something that one person does to another to undercut their agential self-confidence, their ability to function as an agent. Mm -hmm. And here's a case where a disease is doing that. So it's not a case of one person inferiorizing another. It's the disease is challenging the person. And what's needed to shore up the person's dignity is, is to reinforce what agential, reinforce their confidence in their agency, such as it remains, which is what a good therapist or social worker can do in those circumstances. So it points us to aspects of our dignity, I think, that we might otherwise lose track of. Sure. Look at in these in these special circumstances. Oh, thank you. Your your new work on moral work. We we, I know we. I anticipate the opportunity to read this when you, when you're able to bring this to closure. So thank you. Well, as you know, I'm a little bit slow, but it'll <laughs> take a while in its uh, gestation. Well, but. well, every one of your works has been worth waiting for. So thank you, and thank you for joining us for this conversation today. In closing, is there one last word you'd like to, to leave with our community? Well, I, I sure, yes. I, I, I haven't had a chance to talk about Georgetown. And what I want to say is that 
Georgetown has been such a perfect place to do the kind of work that I do, which is broad moral philosophy and also connecting across disciplines and, and also trying to connect with actual policy issues. We have a, a wonderful philosophy department with diverse people, very collegial, brilliant people uh, who work in this way also. And we have the Kennedy Institute of Ethics, which connects with practical issues. And beyond that, the university understands philosophy, cares about reflective life. And you yourself are very supportive of this uh, connection of reflection to actual issues that affect people. So it's just been perfect for me to, to nurture all this work and I appreciate it. Well, we're very fortunate that this has been your, your academic home for almost 35 years now and we're grateful for that every day, Henry. And thank you for taking this time to share these invaluable insights. It's really wonderful to have this time to be with you. My pleasure. And I look forward to being with all of you again soon. Take care of yourselves and take care of everyone around you for every Hoya, everywhere. <laughs>